Hello everyone, I'm Jim Dustridell. Uh, today I'll be doing the Play Like the Pros lecture. So I'm actually going to show two games, not two complete games, but I'm going to show a snippet of this uh, Adams game, and then I'm going to show a game um, by Hare Krishna. I think it was Hare Krishna. Yeah, it was Hare Krishna. Had a had a senior moment in my 30s. Not good. All right. Um, so these games were both played at the uh, Gibraltar Masters, uh, which just concluded. As I mentioned in my previous lecture, it was won by Levon Oronian, but I didn't feel like showing any of his games. So I chose uh, one game by Michael Adams and one game by Hare Krishna, two of my favorite players, actually. And they both had victories in the last round. One was a fairly straightforward victory, one not so much. Uh, so I figured we'd start with this one. This was uh, Adams against uh, Nils Grandelius, very, very talented Swedish player. And the question is, what do you do? It's black to move here. The opening was fairly standard Sicilian with bishop b5 check. Uh, Mickey likes these kind of things because he likes to play kind of slowly, positionally, sort of his style. So if you're black here, what do you do? What do you consider? <coughs> Any thoughts? Doesn't have to be a genius move, just any move. A6. A6 looks pretty normal to me. It could be he was worried about allowing B4 and the knight has to run back, but I don't know, then C4 can be a weakness. I don't know, B A6 looks okay. Moves like Queen B6 look fine. Looks a little funny, but you're just trying to play Rook A D8, complete your developments. Black has plenty of decent options. Unfortunately, he didn't find one. He played this move. So the question is, what's wrong? D5 is a very typical Sicilian move, right? Usually if you can get in D5 safely, it means that you're going to equalize or even get a better position, that good things will happen for you. But it's one of those moves that can be a little treacherous. If you play D5 at the wrong moment, it can actually be a losing or a very bad move. And this happens to be one of those cases. So what do you do if you're white? How do you take advantage of this premature push? You take these pawns. Okay. And then? Ah. So sometimes d5 is wrong because you simply win a pawn. You just take a pawn. But other times, it just, in this case, black is slightly less better developed than white. It doesn't look that way because, you know, two rooks out, three pieces out, but white's pieces are very, are a little bit more active. And this knight in particular is quite nasty. So now, if pawn takes pawn, there's a very easy refutation. Check. Must take with a rook, right? That was pretty simple. Now you're up a rook. Should be sufficient to win at the GM level, one would hope. Mm -hmm. um, so black really can't take this pawn. You could push, but then you're just giving back your pawn at the very least. So black decided, well, I don't want to give up my bishop. I'll just slide back. And this idea actually makes a lot of sense. So white took, black took, white took, black took. And it looks like this is actually very clever. If the queen takes, maybe you play rook d8 and play knight d3. All of a sudden, your pieces are kind of coming in. I don't know. You might get some good counterplay. Um, I think part of the idea also was after queen takes, first of all, pawn takes, that pawn just becomes a weakness. After queen takes, I think this might be his idea, actually. Trade to the end game. In this end game, I don't think it's going to be so easy to win. This knight is no longer good. I'm just going to kick it away. I own the openly open file. Even though you're up a pawn, you're going to have a lot of difficulty winning this position. And I think that, again, Grandelios' idea, maybe he just miscalculated. It's very possible. And he, he definitely did, because he missed what Mickey could do. But he basically thought, I don't want to get tortured in a slow position. That's what Adams likes to do all the time. 
So I want, he wanted to kind of solve his problems a little too eagerly. Again, I'm just guessing. Maybe he just miscalculated something. But uh, white actually has a very, very nasty move here. Nice little Schwitzenzug. That didn't sound right. Whoops. So the idea now, of course, is that if pawn takes knight, queen g4 check, and it mates. And here, it looks like, what have you accomplished? Well, it's one little thing. You just have a tempo now. And how do you defend that f7 pawn? Not so easy, right? If knight e6, this pawn hangs, there's just nothing. So black played queen e6, white snagged this pawn, and now was up two pawns. You do own the open file still. But in general, two pawns co more than compensates for an open file. White just played here and eventually won pretty simply. Two pawns is just way too much. So kind of a brief example. But the basic thing is that when you think you're about to solve all your problems, take a second glance. If you, if you lose five minutes and play it anyway, those five minutes aren't going to cost you too much. But if you're wrong, if you allow an initiative, if you allow some tactics, you could end up really regretting this push. Um, even if he's slightly worse after a move like queen b6, after a move like a6, he'll take that position any day over to playing d5 too fast. So kind of beware situations like this, especially if your opponent's pieces, you find they're springing into action. Even if you don't see the knockout, take a second look. It often means there's something there. Um, so in any case, I thought that was kind of an instructive example. So this one, uh, Hare Krishna was black, a very strong GM from India against Maria Muzichuk. One of the, uh, Gibraltar tends to get a lot of very strong female players. Uh, they offer good conditions and things like this. So she's one of the ones playing, 2540, quite a nice GM herself. So uh, this game was actually quite interesting because Hare Krishna won in the end, spoiler alert. But it was not an easy road. So I'm going to breeze through the opening to make sure we have some time. This is kind of an interesting system. And one of the things I like about Hare Krishna is that he tends to be fine playing systems which are not that common. He doesn't mind going off the beaten track when he plays. Uh, a lot of players really stick to only main lines, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he tends to choose lines not that are bad, but that are sort of side lines, which are a little trickier, and he gets kind of more interesting positions sometimes this way. So he's a good player to follow. And I certainly failed at not talking too much in the opening. So bishop g2, e4, knight e2. This is one of the options, by the way, of playing g3, bishop g2 early that you allow your, your knight to go here sometimes, rather than if you play a knight f3 move order. Of course, there are drawbacks. You're committed to fianchettoing. Knight f3 does not. But uh, this is kind of a setup which sometimes occurs. So this is the idea. So what exactly is black doing, Matt, I ask? <laughs> Look at these pawns. <laughs> Look at this knight. You're pinned. What is the purpose of this? Is he just a crazy person, or was there an idea? Yeah. So the idea is that if black plays d5, which I think is strategically a very poor move, then you don't play here right away like an idiot, but you play here <laughs> first. I really was close. I was close. <laughs> I apologize. And now knight c5 comes, and this square looks pretty nice, right? The fact that you have this pawn, remember what I said about weaknesses in earlier lectures? It's only a weakness if you can attack it. If you play knight knight c5, queen b6, there's no real way you're going to attack that knight. And you can see how this closed center really doesn't help white. In any case, um, white is an experienced GM. She's not going to do that. She played knight d2. Black played bishop e6. So now it's really obvious, right? It's like, please play d5, play d5. Uh, of course, she's not going to oblige him. She plays h3. I don't actually know about the move h3, whether it's useful or not. Um, I think she just wanted to keep pieces out. She wanted to keep some options open. But here, Hare Krishna chose what I'd call a risky move. I thought that, I mean, taking on d4, I think, is maybe what computer wanted. But taking here, 
You get the c5 square, but what's the main drawback of a move like this? Knight to, to the center. Well, the knight does go to the center. That's very true. d5, this knight stays bad. It's a good observation. But apart from this knight getting in, what weakness do you have now? D6. Yes. So this pawn structure is not quite as nice as with the pawns in the center. So it's kind of one, a funny situation. It's one of those times where white actually does not want to have that space advantage. The space advantage hurts you because the pawn on d5 makes it so you can never attack anything. It's kind of a funny situation. But it's actually fairly common. In any case, I mean, there's nothing wrong with taking exactly. Like, this is kind of normal. You have to live with pawns like this when you play a system like this, which is kind of the way it goes. But I wouldn't want to take. Um, so I don't know. I, I kind of like this waiting move, rook e8. Because the idea is if white wants to play a move like f4 now, it's playable, but I'd say it's a little risky. Because now you take, and then there's diagonal action, and I don't know. This looked double-edged to me. Um, but Hare Krishna tried to be more concrete. He played this move. Um, but I believe he underestimated, or maybe he saw it and simply wanted to make the game complicated. But um, Muzichuk found a really, really nice continuation, though. And it's the kind of move that players miss all the time, but one that you have to keep in mind in this kind of structure. Again, notice how if this pawn were on a more normal square, this would never be an issue. But because black's pawns like, are like this, a move like c5 can be really nasty because now you can't defend your center. And with the queen on d8 defending this pawn, a move like this is not as effective. You can just take and probably win a pawn. But now that the, the queen is not guarding d6, this is a real problem. So this was a really, really nice move by Muzichuk. Um, I think maybe objectively best was to play with d5 here. Kind of a tricky move. But after takes, 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 you get a position like this. Probably it's more closer to a draw than a win, but it's kind of unpleasant because you have two b pawns and white has an extra pawn. It doesn't always mean everything, but I would say that it's much harder for black to make a pass pawn and make the extra pawn count. You know. So this is the, the drawback of playing a system like this, by the way. That if things liquidate a little bit, sometimes your doubled pawns you can kind of regret. In a position that's completely closed, of course, the doubled pawns are, I'd say, close to meaningless. Because there's no pass pawn anyway, right? But he wanted to complicate the game a bit more, and it makes sense. And this, you'll, you'll find this happens, that um, especially the last round of a tournament, it often means that drawing doesn't really get you much. A win will get you some nice prize money. I don't know exactly how much he'd get here with a win, but he basically had to win. So there are ways you can complicate the game, not get a lost position, but create some risk. But I think it was too much. So he took on h3. She, of course, grabbed the d-pawn. They exchanged. <coughs> Queen e6. And here she found a very, very nice move. You got to be careful. You got to keep. You want to keep everything together. Your knights look kind of weird, but they actually hold onto your center pretty well. In general, you'd rather have them on these squares, but this pawn kind of annoys you. Uh, do, do you remember the speech at all about opening up your king? I'm just. I'm just curious. That it's not related. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> no, I mean it's 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 a. Uh, it's a type of move you got to look at, because once in a while, a move like this is just totally crushing. But something tells me here it's a little too much. So let's see. What do I want to take, first of all? Mm. Probably I'll take this guy. Also, by the way, I, I hate to... Oh, yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> this, is, this is kind of embarrassing now, right? So like a move like this, right? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah, that, that's, this is why you got to be careful with every pawn push. I know this belongs in my pawn secrets of pawns lecture, but I'm revealing a pawn secret in another lecture. Hopefully, I don't get arrested. Uh, you got to be careful about the weak squares when you push pawns, right? So here, I don't know. It's a little weird, but but also I think I can probably take this guy first, right? This is simpler because now if you play e5, I'll happily go here, right? And this would be, you know, you have a nice pawn chain, but this check is gonna. That check could cause a divorce, that check. It's just so ugly. <laughs> yeah. You didn't know I was going to bring marriage into this, did you? <laughs> All right. So f4, be careful. No, her move was really, really sweet here. Rook a5? Yes. So bringing her rook into the attack 
and putting pressure on this pawn. Note how the knights stay nice, the king stays more or less protected. And this is just a really nice move because now, for example, if pawn takes pawn in here, first of all, you don't have any nastiness with this. You also can't check on d5 to defend the pawn. The rook covers. So you're going to have to move your knight somewhere. And then when I take here, all the squares are covered. Perfect peace harmony. And needless to say, you do not want these pawns in your face. How did she, how did she find that move? Was it just exhaustion of possibilities, preparation? Well, I'm, I'm guessing she found that move when she played c5. Oh. Because otherwise, this whole thing is actually not as good. Okay. Now, if she was really clever, she would have found it before she played h3. But that's probably too far. That's... Even Carlson, I don't think, would see it that far in advance. But after queen c8, if your idea is c5, which is a really strong idea, you kind of have to see this. Because in this position, I think it's the only move that really secures you anything. Okay. Otherwise, your center can fall apart. But after rook a5, and maybe she just saw it at the last minute. It's possible. You know, we're all human beings. But the key is just you need to put pressure on the center while also keeping your position solid. That means keeping these pawns defended. It means keeping your king safe. And this is really the only way to do it, right? So you can do it by process of elimination and also by looking at tempo moves. It looks like a fancy move, but really it's a tempo move. You're attacking a pawn. But it's about controlling squares. Once you see what squares you have to control, usually if there's a way to do it, the piece that has to do it will come to mind. You have to control both these squares at once. There's only one piece that's going to do it, right? And that's kind of where this move comes from. Uh, but it's a very nice move regardless. Black takes here. But here, we come to a major decision. Do you take on e5 with the pawn or with the rook? And finally, we come to a decision which she actually did not make correctly. So I would divide this choice into one move is more tactical. Which move is that? And the other is more positional, rook takes. Why is rook takes more of a positional move? There's less to capture. Nope. Although true, but not the reason. Okay. So basically, I'm so saying yes, but you're wrong. Your yes. Yeah. You have these two monsters. Rook takes preserves these two pawns so they can try to roll down black's face, which, as you know, is a very common tactic. Um, if you play pawn takes, you're forking the two pieces, and you're maybe getting an attack or whatever else. You're getting an initiative, but your pawn, you don't have the two pawns that are like this. So your pawn structure technically is a little worse if you play pawn takes. So it's the question of which, which is more important here. How do you think you figure that out? There you go. It was a trick question, but I didn't trick anyone here, did I? <laughs> Definitely don't do that. I, I bluff all the time, usually unintentionally. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning I blunder is what I'm saying. But. Don't trust me. This, this is all I'm saying. Maybe other pr players you can trust. Don't trust me. I'm gonna. I'm gonna lie. I'd lie to you. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. If there's anything to learn from all my lectures, I would lie to you. The last lecture, <laughs> the last lecture, I blundered a rook. <laughs> I mean, it happens. It just looks like black's gonna get mated if you, like, if you take on e5, take on f6, and take on g7, play knight f4. He wouldn't get mated, would he? No. 2700. But I think that you're kind of overestimating how many moves white gets in a row. It turns out white only gets one move at a time in this particular position. So that, that attack is going to be a little slower than you're imagining. To give you an example, <coughs> pawn takes was actually played. Yeah, rook takes is actually just a really good move. You keep the two pawns. She probably thought that he was getting some counterplay against the pawns. Maybe she miscalculated pawn takes. But for example, if knight c7, the only thing I came up with, she was worried her rook would get stuck. But you can play, for example, knight c4, bring the queen to the center. Rook f5 is always available if you need it. f3 comes if you need to solidify this pawn. d5 can come if you need a tempo move. It's just too solid. These pawns are not useful. Pawns roll in the center. White, I'm not going to say white's completely winning, but white's much better. So this would have been a strong move. But it's easy to get lured by tactics, especially if you think they work. Her idea, of course, was not to take the knight. Maybe it was, and she missed something. But yeah, taking the knight, I think, is just bad. Because I take this rook. I play rook d8, pinning you. 
How quick exactly do you think you're going to do this? I think I'm losing now. <laughs> <laughs> you're a little slow, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's important not to give yourself, like, I mean, when we're calculating, we all kind of have calculating fantasies. And uh, it's very important not to give yourself too many moves in a row. That's one of the common mistakes. People think they get way too much time. Remember, your opponent has moves. If they have useful moves, they can probably stop you from doing what you're doing. So queen d8. And I'm not exactly sure what she missed. Um, she played rook b5. And black has a really, really nice move now. Maybe this is the one she missed. I don't know. But honestly, even if I didn't see this move, I would probably take with the rook. So I don't, I'm not exactly sure. But nevertheless, it's a very nice move. So now your knight is ready to come out, your rook's attacked. So this is sometimes what can happen, the risk of playing the tactical way. Sometimes you miss one move and your whole advantage falls apart. So you have to be very careful. You have to make sure that the tactical way is indeed working. Uh, I would say that if you're ever really short on time, if you're ever not sure, if you see a way to secure such a huge positional edge, you would need to be sure of your tactics to not play it. I doubt that there was huge time pressure this early in the game. You never know. There are some people who are true addicts, but I would say that this was not the situation to go for the tactic. Easy to say in retrospect when I'm just looking at it, but rook takes, knight takes e4, knight f3. So it looks like white's going to end up just double pawn here, right? But it's not so simple. Black plays knight back here. Somehow it went from white having slightly more activity in the center due to this weird knight to black actually having really annoying pieces. Not to mention this pawn is going to look a little tender. So what to do now? To trade or not to trade? Well, you kind of have to trade at some point because your rook's hanging. But do you take the queen or do you not take the queen? I didn't hear anything you said except that you would not take. So good job. Um, however, you need a move. So rook b6 I think is a nice move. But you have to see a little far ahead here. I'm going to take and play here. Oops. But... I still would play this way. And it's all about the pieces. You can make black very uncomfortable with a certain piece. You play rook here, and now? You have two choices to attack the a6. Because this is the piece I'm eyeing, right? That piece looks really sad. I'm no psychologist, but I'm pretty sure that knight's not happy, right? So do you play rook d6 or rook a1? Rook a1. So rook a1 I actually think is a mistake, because now I play here, <laughs> and I'm actually attacking two rooks. <laughs> Didn't know knight b8 could be an active move, did you? No. So this is actually not so good. But you play this one, and now I have to play knight b8, except now you can move back. And I don't know, the knight lands on b3. I'm not saying this is better for white. It might not be. It's one of those positions where probably this knight gets back in the game, you know, but you are, you have a lot for your pawn. But this was the moment where she had to think activity. She had to think, okay, make sure I'm not worse. Probably it's just a draw, because probably you win this pawn, but the knight gets out. It's usually the way these positions work. I, again, it's kind of an experience thing. I can just tell you, usually it's worth the pawn, but not worth more than the pawn when it's this reduced. Usually there's a way to give away the pawn and get this dude out. So something like this move, you know, I don't know. Let's see. Knight here. But now you can probably gang up on this. Let's see. Rook c4, I'm just giving an example. Rook here. This knight has another problem. Oh, I guess I can go to c5. That would be bad. So I guess I, I have to be a little more careful than I am, which is not surprising. Let's see. So rook a7, there should be a way to reel in this pawn. Though. Almost always there's something. So let's see. 
Ah, maybe just start with rook c4. Just go after this guy right away, right? Rook b7. So I was thinking this, but now you have b3. Oh, no. Yeah, just take. Probably a draw. This guy is really bad, but I don't know if you can win it. But OK, here you probably wouldn't do that. You'd probably just come out like knight d7. We trade. We shake hands or something. Again. I'm probably making some errors, but the basic idea is that usually you can win that pawn, but you got to let the knight out. It's just the way the world works, according to me. So in the game, though, black took, or white took, sorry. But now the problem is that this knight is going to head in. And then you have two knights to worry about, not just one. So without being able to put the knight on b8, it becomes a little problematic. So white did this. And now, white has to be careful. So you see how quickly the game turned? She went for the more tactical line, which at first looked super promising, right? She gets the two, she, uh, but you saw how quickly things fizzled. So be very careful about these decisions. So white played rook c7. Again, I think she had to actually stay behind this pawn. I don't think leaving this pawn behind was a good decision. She wanted to stay on the seventh and kind of play that way. But it turns out to be rather tricky. He plays h6, keeping the knight out. Knight c1, rook a1. So now she's going to lose b2. Again, life not so simple. But she finds a counterplay a little bit. She wins this pawn. But unfortunately, because this is weak, now the e pawn has to be given up. So knight d4, rook b3. Seven, all pretty logical. So, how can white make counterplay here? You can try ninety six, but I suspect you'd have a problem with this guy now. <coughs> Let me see. So, for example, let's see how I want to start this. Maybe takes, where do you go, h3 or g1? OK, now I want to go rook e2. So pick your poison, rook or knight. At least I'm hoping it's poison. Otherwise, I'll be embarrassed again, which might happen. Gotcha. <laughs> no, you have g4. Don't, don't give up so soon. The problem is that you, you, I can play rook e4 now and take this. So I don't know. Probably too much, right? Yeah. Um, if like, we're going to give up the f pawn, why not give it up earlier when we have the pawn on e5? Uh, you mean here? Yeah, like just. Oh, it's, sorry. No, I mean, you can. It's just you're probably going to lose the e-pawn also. <laughs> yeah, I forgot. Keep in mind, also, you, you have to make sure this pawn stays guarded, right? So the reason she did this is because she wants to make sure that she gets a rook behind that b-pawn. Because that b-pawn, you give it a couple moves and it lands on b2, then you can resign. So basically, she, white plays king f3 with the idea that now the king gets nice and active, at least. And if knight takes, then she can consider moving the knight to f5. See that? So what does black do? This is the real tricky phase, because so far they played more or less logical moves. She checked, she made sure she won f2, f7, black got the knight active. But this phase is immensely complicated. In general, rook and knight endings can get very nasty. They combine in unexpected ways. Very good. So oftentimes, you're kind of taking a lesson from white. White's activating their king? All right, time for me to do that. Almost always, I'd say, in the end game, mistakes that are made are either pushing pawns too soon or not activating the king. Two most common mistakes I see at the amateur level especially, but even in, even in master games. So if you're in doubt, just activate your king. That's all I'm saying. 
Of course, there's calculation behind it, but the idea is that once your king gets roaming, your opponent's life becomes a lot harder. So white played check. So where's the king going, first of all? That's the one thing. If you start roaming, you have to make sure you have a place to go. But where's the king headed? Okay. So let's run, let's run. But what now? Yeah, this king wants to be run in this way. The problem is white didn't really have a better thing to do because next I'm just going to take this pawn anyway. Like, I was thinking at first that maybe white could have tried... Um, the problem is if you go knight e6, your knight just gets way too far away. Um, and it's not going to really end too promisingly. So, yeah, this is too far. So white tried this. <coughs> But here, she found a good move. Probably the only move, actually. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So black grabs the pump. And this was the key moment. Um, take some before is not a great move, it turns out. It's black's move. Oh, so, so the rook would actually took in the game all before. No, this did not happen. Oh. So what's the idea if I play king d3? I will basically I'm going to take the rook to play knight to 6 and bring my king over to attack the g-pawn. Yeah, this should do. I guess there's this move, though. But now I check and there's this, right? So you can't go here. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say this is one of the things that, like, Hare Krishna is a very good positional player, but I think in his heart, he's a trickster. He's very, very tricky tactically. A lot of his games, he wins with kind of cool tricks or checkmates and things like this. So he's always kind of on the lookout. Uh, but okay, what's the idea if I play king f3? Still legal, right? In Missouri? I don't know. But how to do it? G6 is interesting. So you're going to play knight e3. The problem is that you pass the move to black. So I can maybe play knight f3 check on you or something. So probably you can't play a waiting move just yet. Knight e3. So I guess there are two possibilities. There's king h5 or king h3. I don't know why I'm not listing this as a legal move, but I guess it's mate. So OK, let's try king h5. Life is hard, huh? Uh, knight to d5. Yeah, rook h2, I run to g6. You're kind of chasing me where I want to go. So knight d5. So if knight c6, I have king d6. I assume that's the end. And you also have king f6. Or is that, yeah, king f6 and g6. And king f6, g6. and you're going to mate me? No, like g6. What do I have? You have the g4 square. I was going to play g6 and then king h6 and rook h2 mate, but it's got g4. Maybe, but I think you can be a little less fancy about it. Okay. This just wins, because rook g4 is not even available because you have checked. Maybe I have to try this. But I didn't think this worked. Yeah, I have checked. Ah. You can hide out on h8 if you want. <laughs> but something tells me this is not going to be a draw. Yeah, I could even just, actually, this is kind of embarrassing, but I can even just go here. <laughs> you have no moves. <laughs> oh, why am I so proud of myself? Yeah, you could try a trick, though. Last trick, last trick. The problem is it's not much of a trick, because here you go here, right? <laughs> but I go back, and then, oh, no, it still works. Yes. <laughs> trick. Bam. Look at me. Oh, but this move would win, though. Because you can't go here, because rook takes here, and knight takes. And if back, it's got to be some win. Maybe you can just be real embarrassing about it. 
Why can't you take on like Jesus? Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I went I went a little faster than I intended. I'm allowed to enjoy myself. In any case, uh, yeah, this this knight to d5 is quite strong, I think. So I could play rook c4, but uh, I think you have something here. What do you have here, actually? Hmm. What to do? Not so simple. I'm actually very curious, uh, like, because this position. For some reason, because you know, I, I play, I play, I obviously prepared this today. I play, I picked a bunch of moments, but it's always easy to miss. For some reason, rook takes b4 escaped my attention. So I'm very curious if I'm missing something more obvious here. I don't know what to tell you. So she probably could have taken this pawn, but that's the thing is, I'm guessing there was time pressure. Also, to be fair to the guy, what other choice does he have? You know, she defended it well, she did this. Uh, I thought rook g6 was actually. A way to draw, but this is a hard move to play also because you got to allow check and play here and make sure you don't lose any knights. Um, but she played check, which was actually not the best. So here, actually, he could have won with this move because now you don't get to take the pawn, and this I did check. <laughs> if rook takes d4, I can check here and take the knight, and if knight takes. You can probably use your imagination, but uh, king c5, I believe, is quite strong. Because now if knight d3, you can even just take it. And you don't quite get enough. Mm. So I don't know why he didn't play king d5. But again, I'm guessing that there was time pressure involved, the probably nerves. Um, and again, these kind of positions, you can see how tricky they are. That position looks so promising. Yeah. Um, In the purple there, is that like a, is that the time stamp there? Um, 17? Yeah. yeah, but I don't know what it means. 34, 17, well, maybe. It, has, yeah, it, has it could have been how long they took. You, they could have had 20 minutes and spent 17 seconds. I doubt it. Yeah. But uh, it's pretty tricky. But okay, she checked. He went this way. Yeah. And then here, I think she also played a mistake. She could have checked on d4 or on e7. And this mistake, by the way, I feel like this is the kind of mistake you can learn from because I think this one you can actually just figure out. Regardless of how little time you have. There's a way to distinguish between 97 and 94. Now, it could be she just miscalculated. That's always a possibility. You know, you always have to take direct calculation into account. Maybe after 97, she didn't want to allow king g5 because 97 has rook g6 check, maybe. But I know for sure which one of the two I would play. And for a very, very simple reason, I should say. How do you choose between e7 and d4 without calculating a lot of lines and say you have 15 seconds left? Knight's closer to the pawn, I think. Yeah. You're more centralized. You're closer to both sides. Almost always, if you're in doubt, choose that. I'm telling you, the amount of times it's wrong is so rare compared to how many times it's right. It's just not even close. So I'm not saying, you know, if you have tons of time to just blitz out knight d4. That's a terrible way to play. You know, chess is a concrete game. There are lots of times when you have to play moves like knight e7. But I would say if you don't have the time and you're not sure, keep the knight towards the center. Um, yeah, so this was actually a moment she could have taken this pawn, maybe. But now at least I have this move. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Check. So this is the important feature, right? So knight here, but now you take, and this is pretty simple. So there, he did have a trick. But yeah, uh, knight, knight d4 check, I think, would have been better. So the king has to go here, because that's the thing. If you go here now, I have rook g6 check takes. And the problem now is that you don't have this pawn. Uh, I guess I have to watch out for knight g4 check. But then king f4, king f3. Um, and it's even possible that a move like king f3 is kind of clever now, keeping this knight at bay. Again, very, very complicated position. But uh, king g5 would probably be played to avoid rook g6. But you can see how this is at least still unclear. You still have this pawn covered. You might win it. This pawn is a little bit better guarded. So in the game, this was played. But now the king gets a nice safe haven. Knight g4 check. This pawn is loose. She takes the pawn. 
But the problem now is the knight's on e7, right? So what do you think will cause white problems now? The knight being on e7? Yeah, but more specifically? Uh, the b-pawn. The b-pawn. Oh. Hello. Forgot about me, didn't you? Mm. I, didn't, I meant to do my b-pawn voice, but uh, I haven't done it in a while. So yeah, this is already quite tricky. Um, and by quite tricky, I mean probably just losing. So white tries knight f5. Maybe white had a better defense somewhere, but honestly, this is already very difficult. Probably white had to try something like knight d5. To try to get the knight, again, try to get this knight back, you know. But I think that it's just too tricky, because I can play check, for instance. Oops. And then rook moves, so I don't know exactly where. I was going to move to g2, but that would be unfortunate. Probably f2. But this b-pawn is kind of <coughs> nasty, huh? So I don't know. you got to stop this guy somehow. But it's not such a simple task. In any case, yeah. I mean, there's also knight g4, by the way. Because notice how if you go closer, I have this check. If you go closer here, I take. But it is just one pawn. So you have to be a little careful. Also, there's knight f6, knight e3 moves. h5 is in the air still, but... Yeah. I mean, you be king in, in a pin position. Yeah, it's a little unfortunate. Um, but yeah, honestly, to play this position with no time, like no one's going to play this perfectly. But she played knight f5, and then rook c2 was rather strong. And uh, the purpose, of course, is that now if knight c2, what do you think you guys do? Who cares that your rook's hanging? You're going to get a queen. So if I go behind? And then rook. Right. That's, a whole, that's a whole rook. So it's a little bit too much. So she played behind, but it was basically the same thing. She tried taking this pawn, but... So he messed around a little bit, but I think he was just gaining time. But you still got a pawn to stop. It looks trivial, but I've seen situations where you have a knight, but it's so far away, it ends up not being able to participate. Um, so just to make sure your technique is good, what do you do? Stop that pawn. Notice how king f5 runs into knight e3 check. So I go here. Closer, right? Now what? You want to make sure that your opponent can't play g6, g7 on you, right? What piece can be improved? Mm -hmm. Yeah, king h4 would probably be okay. I like knight e2 check, though, because now you make sure the king can't go here, because you have knight d4. Not the king. And this was the end, because now knight e6 check is coming. Can't be stopped. So fairly trivial. Uh, but again, the key is just make sure this pawn can't move. Bring your knight in. You need to be up a rook for being up a rook to matter. If the knight's here, you're probably not going to win. <laughs> so you need to make sure your piece gets in. But once all the pieces are in, it should be fairly trivial. So again, a, a pretty messy game. Obviously, my analysis of it needed a little work. But the main thing was that the position changed quite a bit. Like out of the opening, she found a lot of powerful moves. So his goal was just to stay in the game, right? But once the tide turned, she had to be very, very careful. She had to make sure she found that counterplay, got the knight passive. Because once, um, you know, once uh, he got to that end game where his pieces were really good, it was tough to defend. Even if she had draws in that position, to draw that in an actual game with the pressure on you and having no time against a 2750 player, not an easy task. Um, so it would, it would have been difficult for anyone to draw once he got all that activity. But one of the things to notice was that, you know, he kind of flowed with the position. When the position was against him, he tried to find his only defensive tries, which he did. 
Um, once the position was around even, he kind of outmaneuvered her. Once he got the ending advantage, he wasn't winning. He wasn't winning for most of it, but he kind of found his chances. He found what he had to do. Um, so chess, I mean, it's nice to play that one game where you just kind of knock your opponent out, kind of like Adams did. But usually you need your opponent's help. Remember how his opponent basically blundered out of the opening? So if you don't have your opponent's help, if your opponent plays strongly, then often it's a mess. You have to kind of just roll with it. But usually the person who kind of collapses last or is not going to end up on the good end. So really he just kind of outlasted her and eventually was able to win.